old fashioned with just a uh, posterior lateral uh, decompression transparticular approach and Steinman pin and methyl methacrylate. She actually made a remarkable recovery, was uh, ambulating at about two weeks with a walker. In terms of her uh, kyphosis, uh, that's actually, it was about uh, 39 degrees and it's 46 degrees uh, 18 months out. Uh, this is just another example um, of, a, of a gentleman who, uh, this was again, 58 year old who presented uh, elsewhere and uh, had a biopsy and diagnosis of a plasmocytoma. He developed acute uh, paraplegia, complete. He began radiation, but uh, he continued to uh, progress. And uh, in discussion with, there was really quite a hesitation to uh, uh, to, for referral for surgery, but uh, uh, in discussion with the oncologist, uh, we did this as sort of a salvage uh, procedure. And uh, he had uh, this, uh, this done um, with actually a very good, uh, again, uh, fortunately, a very good improvement neurologically. Uh, he actually subsequently had a biopsy of his bone marrow, which was positive, and he's been treated with radiation and chemotherapy with stable disease at two years out. In conclusion, in comparing uh, cussed transversectomy and thoracotomy, the complication rates were serious in the, in the patients that were looked at here. Uh, the rates were similar, and the uh, complication in terms of the the distinction was that most of the patients with underwent costar transversectomy actually were sicker uh, and had the higher comorbidities, I, as I said. Uh, um, and therefore, uh, it, it was the conclusion uh, it, that uh, patients with uh, sicker disease, uh, more involvement, advanced disease, and particularly in the upper lumbar spine, that costar transversectomy was uh, preferred. Thank you, Alex. Um, the title for the next presentation that Dr. Chapman assigned me was High Tech or Low Tech Reconstruction. And uh, you know, I thought about it for a while, and I, I can't tell you that I think Carlos said earlier that some of these things are not so straightforward. And uh, when it comes to tumor, um, and Chris will vouch for that too, is almost everything fractures to some degree, but particularly tumors, is so unique that it's a challenge. And it's almost always a mixture of all the tools that you have. And is Brian here, Hanson? He hates these cases probably because we usually have two or three tables of instrument trays. Every cervical tray, thoracic lumbar tray with custom bridging implants and anterior implants and cement and needles and vertebroplasty stuff and sublaminar wires and cables. And we try to figure out what, whatever we can get done. And usually it also means a lot of preoperative planning. Basically, we get CTs and MRIs, and the CT is very crucial for reconstruction because that's where we can plan and see what anchor sites are available for implant fixation still, where the pedicles are still okay, and where the vertebral bodies are still okay, and which lamina we could potentially use for sublaminar wires. This is, I think, what you were asking about. This is a patient that I had with uh, multiple myeloma who'd had kind of progressive back pain that was treated with a primary care doctor. And he suddenly acutely became worse, got transferred to us, and he had acute radiculopathy on, on both sides. He had an L4 lesion with myeloma and an epidural tumor mass. And we do vertebroplasty. We've had a, as always, the last case that goes wrong kind of dictates the next 50 that you do. So we've had a couple of problems with vertebroplasty. Now we do it only as an open procedure. And this patient had a laminectomy done, decompression, and then through the canal, kind of a direct fenestration of the posterior cortex. And instead of injecting, what, what I've gone to doing is just putting pellets of cement and just packing them in gradually. Very doughy, very thick cement rather than liquid cement. Uh, but he's done well. He's now about a year out from this procedure, and his back pain improved. And it, he still has dysesthesias in his nerve, but his strength came back. Uh, this is not really a tumor case. It was an osteoporosis fracture. But certainly in, in tumors, anterior alone is a very nice uh, way to take care of it. And it works well in the lumbar spine for us. We can do an anterior interbody um, structural graft and anterior fixation, and it's usually successful. Uh, this is kind of the main way we've gone to treating tumors. And it's uh, costotransversectomy, where we go 
pretty much circumferentially around the cord from a posterior incision and then use segmental fixation above and below and then fill the gap with either a cage filled with cement. And I agree with Chris, I think bone grafting in some of these patients is futile and uh, possibly detrimental rather than an advantage. So it's either a, a solid cage or well, sometimes I actually prefer to use an allograft simply because it's easier to shape and you can reverse it. Once you inject cement, you're stuck. <laughs> and uh, I, I haven't really liked cement so much. The main thing is uh, rigid fixation. Uh, we we uh, do it any which, which way we can. Anterior structural graft plus posterior fixation. This case I wanted to show uh, simply because going back to using every technique you have, this guy had a dermatofibrosarcoma. It extended from T8 to L1, and it was paraspinal, but it, it touched the vertebra, and we wanted to do an on block resection. And the interesting thing, if you look at his MRI, particularly the coronal images, and this is in retrospect, we noted this, but his tumor lights up more than his kidney in the contrast scans. So it's a very, very, very vascular tumor. But uh, with embolization, we were able to get control of it and then do hemivertebrectomies and then use his own rib to kind of, you can see the screws, just to screw the rib onto the remaining vertebral bodies anteriorly and posterior segmental fixation. And he's about eight months out now with, uh, with an anterior fusion. So no cage at all. Uh, these are a couple of patients I'll show you with chondrosarcoma where we had to do circumferential or on block resection of the cervical spine. This patient had an osteosarcoma at C6 and 7. You can see that it, we use a structural allograft, uh, a customized rod plate with lateral mass screws, sublaminar wires at each level, anterior plates, and then thoracic pedicle screws. So old techniques and new techniques mixed together. Same with this patient, uh, basically finding any which way where you can put a bone graft. We put one small in the vertebral bodies and one between the lateral masses from C2 to C6, I think. And again, sublaminar wires, transarticular screws, rod plates going up to the occiput all the way to the thoracic spine. So usually we've gone to any which way we can do it and uh, to get the most rigid fixation we can. This patient is, I think, four years out now from his um, chondrosarcoma of the cervical spine, and he was 16 at the time. He's 20 now, and he's doing actually well with no recurrence. So our approach has been creative. Any, anything we can get in, high-tech or low-tech, are usually mixed. Okay. The next... Uh, Presentation is uh, Dr. York, osteomyelitis. Well, there's been, a, over the past decade, there's been an increase in the reported number of cases of osteomyelitis. The uh, reasons are probably multifactorial, including HIV and uh, IV drug abuse. Vertebral osteomyelitis is a difficult problem to manage. Patients frequently, frequently have multiple medical problems which complicate their course. And there's often a delay in uh, the diagnosis. The good news is with improved imaging techniques and improved methods of uh, spinal reconstruction and stabilization, we're better able to manage these patients. Uh, this uh, shows the causative, eight, uh, the causative organisms with Staph aureus being the most common, followed by uh, gram-negative rods, uh, mostly E. coli and uh, Pseudomonas. Bacteremia was documented in 56% of the cases. A CT-guided biopsy or aspiration was positive in 69%, and then the interoperative cultures were positive in about uh, 80%. Uh, only 71% of the patients, or about a quarter of the patients, were diagnosed in the first month. And I'm, I'm sorry, I might not have mentioned, there were 250 patients uh, in this study. It was a quite large study, uh, but only a quarter of them were diagnosed in the first month. The uh, median time to a diagnosis was 1.8 months. And in 51% uh, of the patients, they were able to identify a predisposing extravertebral infection. The most common uh, infection was a urinary tract infection. About a third of the patients actually acquired their osteomyelitis while they were in the hospital. 15% uh, developed osteomyelitis after a spine surgery or penetrating uh, spine trauma. They lumped those two together. It's a 66-year-old gentleman comes in no significant past medical history, comes in complaining of fevers, night sweats, and mid-back pain. 
This is MRI. At this point in time, a transpedicular biopsy is performed and Staphylococcus aureus is the bug that's, that's maintained or grown out. So he's placed on appropriate antibiotics. He's put on bed rest for a couple of days. Here's his MRI. And he's put in a brace. He's now four weeks into his IV antibiotic course. Sed rate hasn't come down. His fevers haven't defervesced. So repeat his MRI at six weeks. He's now six weeks on IV antibiotics, appropriate bug for appropriate IV antibiotic for Staph aureus. And he still is not any better. Here's a repeat MRI after six weeks of IV antibiotic therapy. Only complaint at this point in time is back pain, fevers, and night sweats. That's it. So he's placed on six weeks of IV antibiotics, and he's placed in a brace, and he's got him up and about. I think there's a strong possibility he could have uh, some type of subacute endocarditis with, a, <laughs> with no other uh, past medical history. That we're aware of. Was that worked up? Well, we got an echocardiogram. At, okay. at six weeks, nutritional albumin, 3.7 uh, echocardiogram normal. And again, as I said, he persisted. His fevers persisted. He didn't get better over a six week period. His repeat MRI shows extension of the disease process. And then here's his x ray at seven weeks after his diagnosis is made. Here's a series of x rays which show progressive kyphosis. Did this patient have an HIV test? The HIV was negative. Okay. Here's his repeat MRI. He's starting to develop some leg weakness at this point. He's had one biopsy of the vertebral body and multiple blood cultures during the eight-week period. Again, so, all with Staphylococcus aureus. So there was no uh, organism shift? No change. There was no resistance no shift? No change in the organism. But the sedimentation rem rate remained high it over remained high, six started to, to go up period. a little bit at the end. Started to go up a little bit into the 80s at the end. But the bottom line is, Here's a guy who's shown resistance to non-operative measures. Okay? You can argue the non-operative measures, but he's shown resistance. He's shown progressive kyphosis, and now at eight weeks, he's starting to develop a neurologic deficit. I think it's, I think now, I, I don't think anyone would argue with the surgical indications here. So what we did is we took him to the operating room and actually did this posteriorly first. He had a predominantly left-sided process. I reduced him posteriorly under SSCPs, had no changes, did a wake-up test and then through a left-sided anterior approach, did a thorough debridement and placed a cage. And then we got him up out of bed. Bug? He was up out of bed within two days and walking. His infection has since resolved. What's the literature as far as metallic cages in the place of yeah. the vertebral osteomyelitis versus the allograft versus? There are, there's a good study from the DeWald group in Chicago that shows that you can put metallic cages, you can put allograft in, in active infection without any problem. And, and that's actually been repeated by Larry Lanky and Keith Bridwell during the past year with similar conclusions. It doesn't make a difference whether you put an allograft in, whether you put a titanium cage in. As long as you're supplementing that with rigid fixation, I think that's the, the main issue. Bob, that was beautifully done. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, and thank you for being willing to serve as a target. Mm -hmm.